Greetings, comrades and allies. My name is Monica Moorhead, pronouns she, her, and I'm a managing editor of Workers World Newspaper. I am so proud to be chairing this session on the voices and supporters of the heroic Palestine resistance at this anti-imperialist assembly, honoring the centennial death of the legendary leader of the great Bolshevik revolution, Vladimir Lenin. As a black communist, I feel that one of Lenin's greatest theoretical contributions that is still omnipresent is national oppression and the right to self-determination for oppressed nations all rooted in imperialism, regardless of geographical location or historical experience for the pro pro super profits that drives the billionaire ruling class. Lenin's theories have influenced not only our party, but other revolutionaries and revolutionary movements in various epochs. For instance, the great Malcolm X, who took his last breath in this historic venue almost 60 years ago, once said in his 1964 essay, Zionist Logic, that, quote, the ever-scheming European imperialist wisely placed Israel where she could geographically divide the Arab world, end quote. That was 1964. In 1966, Black Panther Party leader Huey P. Newton wrote, quote, Israel was created by Western imperialism and is maintained by Western firepower, end quote. Our party understood the significance of the Palestinian anti-colonialist national liberation struggle when just eight years after our founding in 1959, we organized the first left demonstration inside the United States in solidarity with Palestine that was confronted by the pro-Zionist Jewish Defense League. And 14 years later, following the election of Ronald Reagan, our party helped to organize a march of 100,000 people against the Pentagon War on El Salvador where the first Palestinian was invited to speak at a major U.S. anti-war rally. And from the first Antifada in the late 1980s to today, notwithstanding the unspeakable genocide taking place inside Gaza and the West Bank, Palestine has taken center stage in the world's struggle against imperialism. Not only has this anti-imperialist struggle been galvanized by the unity of Palestinian resistance forces, but has helped forge unity amongst movements across borders, despite any ideological differences. And this growing unity and solidarity is scaring the imperialists to death. This solidarity spanning globally will help deepen working class consciousness, the epitome of Leninism that will impact not only the workers in the global south, but also in the global north to reflect that the struggle knows no borders. The South African complaint that put Israeli genocide on trial worldwide helped to deepen this class consciousness, but it won't stop there because now South Africa, with the backing of almost 80 governments, has announced plans to take the U.S. and Britain to the world court for their war crimes, for their war crimes of being complicit with this genocide of the Palestinian people. And Indonesia, Chile, and Mexico are filing their own complaints against Israeli genocide. And even if these legal complaints are politically symbolic, they are important barometers that reflect the millions of outraged masses over the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people and will further isolate Israel and their main backers, Western imperialism led by the US. 
And not only must we, inside, being inside the belly of the beast, defend the resistance inside of Palestine, but beyond Palestine. And we all know that Yemen has shown solidarity with Palestine, not only in words, but in action, with literally millions of people in the streets. And also their naval forces have prevented numer numerous Israeli cargo ships from safe passage in the Red Sea until the demand of dire humanitarian aid is allowed into Gaza. And since then, Yemen has faced ruthless bombing from both the U.S. and its junior partner, Britain, against its civilian population as punishment for its principal stance. And I'm so proud to introduce as our for first voice of resistance, a video message from Nazrandine Amir, director of the Yemeni news agency Sabah, and vice president of the Ansala Media Authority, hands off Yemen, hands off Yemen, hands off Yemen. So let's hear from my brother from Yemen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد السيدة والسادة المستمعين الحاضرين المشاركين جميعا تحية لكم من هنا من اليمن من اليمن المساند لفلسطين الواقف إلى جانب الشعب الفلسطيني المظلوم المستلب التي احتلت أرضه منذ عشرات السنين وما زال العالم يغض الطرف عن هذه الجريمة المستمرة النكراء التي تتضاعف ظلما وإجراما مع الوقت ومن هنا من اليمن الذي يقف اليوم مع هذه المظلومية يساندها نيابة عن العربي وعن المسلمين وعن الأحرار في العالم كله وعن البشرية إن جريمة الكيان العدو الإسرائيلي بحق الشعب الفلسطيني ومن يقف مع كيان العدو الإسرائيلي الأمريكي والبريطاني والفرنسي وغيرها من الدول التي تقف خلف كان العدو الإسرائيلي إنها لوصمة عارم في جبين البشرية كلها أن يقال في تاريخ من التواريخ وأن يكتب في الكتب وفي التواريخ بأن شعبا تعرض لمثل هذا الظلم بكله ولم ينصره أحد من البشرية وظلت البشرية وهي في عالم الفضاءات المفتوحة والتواصل المفتوح والإعلام المفتوح تشاهد مثل هذه البشاعة وبهذه المجازر والجرائم ولم تحرك الإنسانية شيئاً إنه لوصمة عارم في جميل البشرية ولذلك نحن نسعى أن نقوم بواجبنا من منظورنا الديني الذي يحتم علينا هذا الموقف ومن منظور إنساني أيضاً لكي نمسح هذا العار ولكي يقال أيضاً إذا ما دون التاريخ هذه الجرائم بأن هناك أيضاً من وقف مع هذه المظلومية نقدر عاليا كل المواقف في الدول التي حكوماتها بعضها تقف مع كيان العدو الإسرائيلي لكن هناك من الأحرار من يقفون ضدها هذه الأصوات مقدرة ومثمنة وشجاعة ويحسب لها هذه المواقف ونحن هنا من اليمن من الجبهة المتقدمة في دعم الشعب الفلسطيني نوجه لهم التحية ونشكرهم كل الشكر على هذه المواقف التي يقفونها والمسيرات التي يخرجون, يخرجون فيها في الشوارع وفي كل الأماكن التي يمكن أن تؤثر ولكي يفضحوا هذا العدو المجرم الذي يقتل الشعب الفلسطيني هذه أصوات مثمنة ومقدرة ويحسب لها حساب عند كل البشرية نحن وأنتم في خندق واحد لنصرة الشعب الفلسطيني والوقوف مع الشعب الفلسطيني في مواجهة الاستكبار العالمي البغيض الذي يقتل الشعب الفلسطيني وإن شاء الله أننا سننتصر وسنوقف هذه المجازر وهذه البشاعة وسننتصر للشعب الفلسطيني حتى ينال حقه الكامل في أرضه مثل بقية شعوب العالم الذي نستعاد وانتهت حقبة الاستعمار والاحتلال في العالم كله ولم يبقى إلا الشعب الفلسطيني يعاني تحت وطأة احتلال مستمر بتواطئ عالمي من كل العالم تحياتنا لكم من اليمن نحن نؤكد لكم بأننا لن نتراجع لن نتوانى لن نخضع للضغوطات سنظل كما شاهدتمونا وتدعمونا وتقفون إلى جانبنا وتصلنا أصواتكم سنظل أيضا أوفياء لهذا الدعم الذي يصلنا منكم الدعم المعنوي والدعم الإعلامي سنظل أوفياء لهذا الدعم ولن نتراجع تحت أي ضغط من هؤلاء الأعداء ولا تحت أي ترغيب ولا ترهيب سنبقى ثابتين واقفين متقدمين 
سنحاول أن نوسع من عملياتنا دعما للشعب الفلسطيني المظلوم المبهور حتى ينتصر بإذن الله وفي الختام تحياتنا لكم ونشكر لكم هذا اللقاء المهم ونتمنى أن تستمر كل الفعاليات والأنشطة دعما للشعب الفلسطيني إلى اللقاء I'm really, really proud to introduce our next speaker, Rabab Abduhaldi, who's a Palestinian-born U.S. activist and educator and editor, founding director and senior scholar of Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diasporas studies at San Francisco State University. Welcome, Comrade Rabab. I'm going to put it here. All right. Okay. Hold on. Masa al khair. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. As we gather today on the land of the Lenape, indigenous, unlike the Palestinian people, forcibly uprooted and displaced, we honor one of the greatest figures in the 19th and 20th century whose relevance continues until today, and perhaps no more than today. Also, not lost on us, the place in which we mean, meet. Hajj Malik Shabazz and Dr. Betty Shabazz hall here, and that remind us of the need, of the connection between people's struggle, and the need for both reparations for over 200, 300 years of enslavement, as well as for accountability and atonement for what has happened and what continue to happen today. I also want to thank Workers' World Party, not only for organizing this very important assembly and remembering these anniversaries, but also for the long history of struggle and support of the Palestinian people, both at the time when Palestinians were rising and resisting, and at the time when Palestinians were under the gun and being attacked. It has been very consistent support, and this is not lost and will never be forgotten by the Palestinian people. I actually don't have time to get into all of this, because if I do, it is a chapter in a book I'm writing. <laughs> there is a lot that's going on. On a personal level for me, it's also very important to be commemorating the centennial of Lenin's passing, because I studied in a city named Leningrad, and I was honored to visit the mausoleum of Lenin and I have learned a lot of Marxism and the teaching there throughout my education. So to me, this also has some sentimental value. But also, it's really important to remember today, as we enter the 108 days of the Israeli genocide in Gaza, we remember the siege of Leningrad. And it's really important for us to recall history which lasts from 1941 to 1944, 1.5 million people were martyred. 872 days lasted too long. It was too long. And at that time, it wasn't considered a crime against humanity. So we do know that Gaza will last and will be steadfast and will not be defeated. In the short time I have, I cannot discuss everything
that's really important about what Lenin, what the moment means, I'm going to focus on a few points. One of the most important contributions of the October Revolution that was led by Lenin was the exposure of a secret agreement between the British and the French called the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 that was held in the vault of the Tsar. And when the October Revolution took place, the Polish Bolsheviks decided to open the vault. European countries pleaded with them not to, and they said, we're going to do it. And when it was exposed, it exposed to the pa Palestinians first and the Arabs. Second, that the British and the French who were promising, making promises to support Arab independence were actually plotting to divide the fertile crescent, which is greater Syria and Iraq among them. Iraq, Jordan, Transjordan and Palestine for the British, Syria and uh, Lebanon for the French. And that was exposure of what was going on and for the Palestinians understanding that those who were running from the pogroms and who were running from anti-Semitism in the Eastern Europe were not only running seeking refuge, they were actually trying to set up a settler colonial project in Palestine. And thus, when the Balfour Declaration came by the British uh, uh, government, by the British foreign minister, promising the land of Palestine that did not belong to the British, to the Zionists, for whom it didn't belong either, Palestinians rose and in in increased their resistance. And this is why when we talk about intifada, we don't talk about first intifada, second intifada. There are many intifadas in the history of the Palestinian people, even though historians like to go by the conventional way of thinking about specific periods. The second uh, uh, um, contribution was Lenin's support for the right of nations to self-determination. And the very important debate that he conducted with Rosa Luxemburg where she argued against uh, the, the national question and Lenin argued for the right of uh, people to self-determination and in it uh, continued to this very day and I'll come back to that. But then also another thing that Lenin reminds me of it that he was imprisoned for a year without charges under interrogation and then exiled to Siberia for a year. And this reminds us of the Palestinian prisoners, over 7,000 now, who have been continuously imprisoned under something called administrative detention that Israel inherited in emergency laws from the British colonialism before and continues to exercise against the Palestinians. And we know every single day we hear more and more and more uh, arrests. And so this is the exile too reminds us of Palestinians being deported. And also one of the men, not only the Palestinians being deported and expelled as in Nakba, but also it's really important to remember that the deportation by Israel of many Palestinian leaders and organizers, one of the biggest deportation was in 1992, when 415 resistance from Islamist groups were deported to Marj al-Zuhur in south of Lebanon, and they refused to go back to Lebanon, to Beirut, and insisted to stay there. And through their insistence, they succeeded to return back. And some people who analyze today said that this might have been part of the nucleus that strengthened the current resistance in Gaza. Another, another point, and I'm running through them very fast in respect of time. Another point that was really important that Lenin's question, what is to be done? About the importance of building a party, about the importance of discipline. Because imagine if the fighters today were not disciplined and every one of them was sitting around deciding whatever they feel like doing and thinking about let's wait and until we discuss, let's take time out, let's engage in self-care and so on, where would resistance be? I'm not knocking down the need for people to take time to build because, not to sprint, because we are in a long protracted struggle. But it was one of the very important things that actually had a lot of emphasis in the Palestinian movement historically, in all the Palestinian resistance groups. 
and as well as the groups that are continuing today, some from before and some newer who are resisting in Gaza. I don't know if I'm making a big stretch by saying it's Iskra, the spark, is Iskra. Can we compare Iskra to Aqsa flood? I'm thinking about it. You know, we can think a little bit broader and so on. I, I don't know. The book is out there on that. But I think one of the other things that Lenin uh, learned, and he learned it from his brother, Alexander, who tried to assassinate the Tsar, and his brother said that he wanted to kill the Tsar because it was the only way to achieve political freedom for the Russian people. This was probably one of the earlier ways in which the discussion of armed struggle and revolutionary violence comes up. Not exactly and not directly because it was an individual action. It wasn't necessarily an organized thing and so on, but it's something for us to actually think about, especially when people think this is an alien project, uh, subject that we, we cannot talk about. Uh, the also another thing about the ways in which 1920 European colonial governments, capitalist governments, England, France, Germany, and the United States imposed the boycott in, on Russia and refused to deal with the new regime and canceled the, the diplomatic uh, representation as well as the commercial and uh, industrial uh, uh, pacts. And this would remind us of how when the United States and Israel and European countries were not happy with the results of the Palestinian democratic elections 2006, imposed a blockade on Gaza that lasted for 16 years now in 2007, starving them. And we spoke, we heard about Cuba and actually thinking about what does the blockade, the strangulation that it does, people don't understand uh, what does this really mean. So I think this is very important to think about that. And it's also to understand why is it that the Palestinians broke the borders and went into the lands that they were there for people who do not know, majority of the refugees in Gaza come from Naqab and come from G uh, Hebron. They are all from those areas. Now, when Israel was founded in 1948 and Palestinians were displaced, majority of the Palestinians in the south were pushed to Gaza. So they broke to see their land. They broke out of their captivity. They broke the siege that was imposed upon them. Who doesn't want freedom? Two more points that I wanted to mention. One is the, the, the question that actually clings with the analysis of Lenin of imperialism being the highest stage of capitalism, which I'm not going to get into now because it, it's the whole Palestinian resistance history. But I think it's really important to link it also to Lenin's legacy, where it comes from Marxism. And Marxist analysis of the Jewish question, which I'm sure my comrade probably my, Michael might, I don't know if you're going to plan to talk about it, but I only wanted to mention one thing that is very connected between imperialism and capitalism and war, that what happened after Balfour Declaration is that, first of all, Zionism was only one recipe for solving anti-Semitism, because Marx came up with a, with a recipe that is for everybody to fight together against racism, uh, the discrimination, chauvinism, Whatever, so which means today we can fight against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Arab discrimination, anti-blackness, against indigeneity, and so on and so forth. That's, that's the way to build a different society. Zionism decided to do something different, but in the process of doing something different and trying to build a settler colonial state on the land of the Palestinians, they also banded and put their lot along with the European capitalist class in order to satisfy the European anti-Semitism of emptying Europe from the Jews, thus solving the European anti-Semitic problem, and taking them and putting them in another ghetto called Palestine, which we know today is actually a failing project. It is a failing project. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis are leaving. Israel does not keep statistics because they don't want to tell us. Majority, over 50% of the Israeli youth are actually depressed 
And of course, who wouldn't be depressed if you are part of an army that is involved in annihilating and genociding another people? We're just waiting for the moment when Israeli, young Israelis move from demanding only freedom for captives, 100 captives compared with 7,000 Palestinian prisoners, right? 800,000 Palestinian prisoners were in prison since 1967. Think about, the, think about these figures. How, does, how will this movement develop like the movement during the 1982 invasion of Lebanon in Israel that was called Parents Against Peace? And when soldiers stopped participating and be, became part of a movement called Yesh Gvul, which I'm honored to be with one of the people here, and resisted fighting, and along with the resistance of Lebanon, liberated the south of Lebanon in 2000 and abrogated the first time the quote-unquote peace agreement between Lebanon, Israel, and another Arab country, Lebanon. First time. It can be done. It is not inevitable that we must be defeated. The last point I want to mention is that, and I think this is something that is not understood because people think, why, what, what, should the, what should Islamist groups, what should Islamic resistance have to do with Lenin? who's a Marxist, you know, we know what Marxism is, and this whole anti-communist uh, red-baiting that's going on. Well, it's very interesting, and I think for people who do not uh, remember, is that on, on, uh, on November 24, 1917, Lenin sent a message to the Muslims who are under within the, 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 the Russia and expanded that became the Soviet Union, and said, you, for whom the Tsars have destroyed mosques and messed up with your convictions and your habits and your, uh, your nat national and cultural uh, institutions, they are today sacred. Your life and the life of your people is yours. Please know that the great revolution and the Soviets of uh, um, parliament members, workers, soldiers, and peasants will defend your rights and the rights of all the people in Russia. They created a program that we could call today affirmative action, by which they removed the settler Russians on Muslim lands and returned repatriated land back repatriated the land of the Muslims back to them. Russian language stopped being a hegemonic language, which is something that Israel is trying to do today. Actually, it's done. They passed it already. And they were given, Muslims, priority in appointments, in communist parties, and new universities were actually created to train new leaders who are not Russian. This is not something that people know. All the, the, the ruins, all the books, Muslim books, all the heritage that the Tsars took away from the mosque, ripped, were given back. Compare that with the destruction today of all the heritage of the Palestinians in Gaza in, in, in order to erase Palestine as an idea and as a people. The Quran, was given back to the Islamic uh, 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 Council in Petrograd in December 25th, 1917. Friday was declared as a day of remember of day for the Muslims and an official holiday in all of Western Asia. Why do I say all of these things? I think it's really important for us to learn, to study to learn from the lessons of history. Take the occasion of the centennial of this amazing figure who taught so much, who fought and fought and fought and fought. All his life is full of struggle. Amazing. That allows us to commemorate those who have been victorious among us and also commemorate the massacres that have happened, both to remember and place at the center of analysis the people who are struggling, and to demand nothing less than freedom, than justice, than peace for all people, Palestinians, 
justice in and for Palestine is part and parcel of the indivisibility of justice. We will win. Venceremos. from Masar Badil, the Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Path. Greeting, comrades. My name is Khalid Barakat. I am a member of the Masar Badil, the Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Path Movement. It's an honor to be with you today, commemorating 100th year of the departure of the great thinker and leader, Lenin. Today, as Palestinians and Arabs, we remember the contribution of this great revolution to our cause. When the revolution in Russia exposed the schemes of colonialist power that were set for our regions, particularly the Sykes-Pico uh, plans to divide the Arab people and the Arab homeland. It is also due to Lenin uh, revolution and the people of uh, Russia uh, sacrifices that a uh, new chapter of our struggle in our region have begun when we start witnessing the birth of socialist organizations and communist parties in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Palestine, and elsewhere. As it is important to commemorate the departure of Lenin every year, it is also important to celebrate his birth on April 22nd of every year. And the celebration of the lives of Lenin and the many leaders and comrades who have contributed to the cause of justice and socialism and liberation uh, for humanity and for uh, people across the world. Today in Palestine, the Palestinian struggle have entered a new stage on October 7th of last year and for over 100 days, the Palestinian people have been engaged in resistance and resilience, resistance and reviving the Palestinian revolution for return and the liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. The Palestinian people today are united in Palestine and in the diaspora, marching behind their resistance, and the Arab people and Muslims across the Muslim world and the free people of the world. Today, millions of them are coming out in the streets, calling for justice for Palestine, calling for the support of the Palestinian people, resistance for liberation, calling for the end of Israeli occupation of Palestine that have uh, been um, for the past 75 years. Palestinian people, despite all of their harsh conditions that occupiers have subjugated our people to, with the full support uh, that Israel enjoys from the United States and the imperialist and Western powers, and the complicity of the Arab reactionary regime, the Palestinian people uh, were able to maintain their struggle and their resistance and at the same time, they are uh, redirecting the compass of the struggle of the region to the actual main contradiction between the people of the region and imperialism. The people of the region 
against the Zionist regime. It is also important to see that with the minimum uh, capabilities of the Palestinian resistance, they are able to continue their struggle against this vicious, racist, colonialist regime of Israel. But this is also do, doable because uh, and possible because of the support of the people of the world to the Palestinian people. And we have seen that cities across the world, towns, universities, schools, unions, uh, workers from India to uh, the United States, from Africa to every city in Asia are coming out to say that Palestine is also our issue. And it's not just the Palestinian people cause, but it is the cause of all people who are struggling for liberation and justice across the globe. Today, we want to thank you for inviting us to be part of this very important event to reaffirm our commitment to socialism as the alternative to capitalism and to liberation as an alternative to subjugation and submission. The people of the world are waking up. The people of the East are rising. The people of the world are united. It is really uh, historical days that we are witnessing when people struggle are so much connected more than ever and that resistance is possible more than ever. A new generation is born and this, th this is a struggle of all generations, from Lenin generation to the new generation to the future generations marching for a true justice and that people to be truly uh, practice self-determination, not just in words, but in real ways, to be the masters of their destiny, to be also uh, uh, living in one world for uh, socialism and for liberation. Thank you again, and victory is imminent. Okay, next we're going to hear from Suzanne Adderley, who is president of the National Lawyers Guild and co-director of the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Check, check. So obviously, Aging the there we go. Here we go. We're working on it. You want to start from the beginning, maybe? No? The use of international law to obtain Yay. accountability for crime is perpetrated by racist, colonial, and imperialist states such as Israel and the U.S. has been, legally speaking, an impossible task. However, anti-imperialist lawyers continue to engage in international law because of the political value it can serve. It is a real challenge to continue engaging the international legal order to obtain justice for our peoples, especially when institutions like the ICC act in no way to protect our peoples, but to protect imperialist powers. Or when we know that weaker states are often bullied by Western states to vote a particular way. And when we see scenes play out like the shameful vetoing of a mere ceasefire at the Security Council by the United States. Instead, the Security Council is used to give the US and UK political backing to attack and kill Yemenis once again, when Yemen is acting under its own obligations of the Genocide Convention to prevent genocide by using its strategic position to stop commercial ships from reaching Israel. We know clearly that the international legal order has been structured 
to serve and still very much serves the interests of imperialism, capitalism, and it is permeated by Western hegemony. Yet 10 days ago, when a magnificent South African legal team descended on the International Court of Justice in The Hague, laying out an outstanding case that Israel is committing genocide and demanding immediate steps to be taken to end the ongoing genocide, it felt different. It's not exactly about the expected outcome, although that will certainly be important. There could be relatively positive legal outcomes coming out of the first stage of these hearings, yet there's always the challenge of enforcement and the backroom attempts to sabotage the whole process. Yet first and foremost, the moving and often infuriating testimonies of the legal team itself made the ICJ a forum for truth for the world to see and hear, despite US and UK and other Western attempts to ignore and dismiss this process as baseless. Those who witnessed the hearing in person or televised, or even those that have watched clips are left with little doubt that Israelis are engaging in one of the most brutal examples of colonial violence of our time, and the evidence will soon implicate those that have aided and abetted this genocide, namely the US. The significance of South Africa leading this struggle cannot be overstated. They not only know what it means to live in an apartheid system and successfully struggle against it, but they've also historically struggled against violent white settler colonial invaders in their own lands, colonizers who were deeply entrenched with Israel to support their own settler colonial project. The ICJ case has become a stage where a confrontation between the countries of the global south and the north is playing out with formerly colonized nations like South Africa on one side and on the other side, the states who have themselves all engaged in violent settler colonial projects have engaged in genocide or benefited from it. The case itself reflects a rejection of imperialism a rejection of Western hegemony by South Africa and a call for the nations of Latin America, Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean, Asia and Africa to join them by providing legal and political support. A rejection of imperialism and a rejection of Zionism. If we get any semblance of a positive outcome in the first hearing stage, we need to do everything we can to pressure states to enforce the order to stop the genocide and hold Israel accountable. We also need to act to ensure that this process is not sabotaged and the ICJ will do its job and rule in agreement with the overwhelming evidence uh, that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. The political pressure is vital now and it will continue to be vital. The entire international legal order is on trial and if it fails to meaningfully act, we need to start thinking about what it means to build something new. My last comment is not about the ICJ, but it's related to how we use the law. We need to normalize, resist, we need to normalize resistance. We need to normalize the understanding of the right of resistance from Palestine to Yemen to Lebanon to the Philippines. Counterinsurgency culture has caused the basic right of resistance, which is legal, moral, and political, the basic right of resistance of colonized people to be abandoned to the imperialist controlled discourses of terrorism and liberal human rights regimes. Both, are the, both of these discourses are used as weapons against our movements. From Gaza to Yemen, long live the resistance. One of, one, one of the most important groups that is on the front lines with the people of, Pal of Palestine has always been Hezbollah. In Lebanon, always on the front lines. So next we're gonna hear from Dr. Abraham Masawi, who's a Hezbollah member of the Lebanese parliament and editor of the weekly newspaper Criticism in Beirut.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace be upon you all it gives me the pleasure and the honor to address your assembly the international assembly against imperialism and in solidarity with the Palestinian resistance yes the resistance this is the right time for resistance and we should all stand to support resistance against imperialism against occupation against genocide against the tyrannies that are taking place in Gaza and in Palestine. Believe me now, the Palestinian cause and the Gaza cause is not a Palestinian, is not an Arab, is not an Islamic cause, is not a Christian cause. It's a human cause per excellence. Everyone who believes in humanity should support Palestine and stand in support with the Palestinians. And believe me, what you are doing there in the Western capitals, the congregations, the demonstrations, the statements that you are making in an individual level, and in a community level and in society level is much needed and is very much appreciated by our people here. Believe me that you are sending the right message in the right time, in the right way. And we believe that you should hold the officials responsible for their support against the Palestinians, for their support for the Israelis against the Palestinians. And the officials in the West are partners and accomplices of the atrocities that are taking place in Gaza. Yes, what you are doing is very much needed. And we here, we are giving uh, sacrifices, huge sacrifices by our people, by our martyrs, more than 150 martyrs in Lebanon against the Israelis and against the Israeli occupation. We believe that it's time to raise our hands, to raise our voices, to make actions. Actions speak louder than words. We should boycott the Israelis. We should raise the voice in support of the Palestinians. We should hold our responsibles, our officials responsible for all of the actions that Israel is taking and for all of the supplies, the military supplies and the political coverage that they are offering for Israel. I tell you very frankly that we follow up everything that you are doing in the West and it's not in your names. We believe that the people support the people and they understand the tragedy and the misery of the Palestinian people. Here we are in a very courageous way, fighting the Israelis, struggling, struggling against them, and we believe your work would complete and will, will fulfill our mission in another way and another style. What we really need you to believe in, that we are very keen that you are doing what you are doing. We want to go into another level, and I want you to know that it's in the eyes of the people in the eyes of Allah, in the eyes of all the honorable people, all those who believe in liberty, all those who believe in dignity, all those who believe in independence are there in order to help. Please continue your good work. We really wait for your work and we really support this work and we are together one front against Israel against the United States and its tyranny and against all the Western hegemony and imperialism. It's time for liberation. It's time for action. Long live Palestine. Long live Gaza. Long live the International Assembly. And may us, may God help us all. We're going to hear from Susie Abahawa, who is a prominent Palestinian novelist, activist, and member of Workers' World Party. Greetings, comrades. I wish I could have been there in person to share in this historic conference, which stands as a testament to the people's enduring and unyielding struggle for universal justice and universal dignity. This International Assembly Against Imperialism comes at a time of genocide, the only moment in history where victims are literally live streaming their own demise, whole families buried alive in the dust and debris of their homes or crushed under the weight of the walls and the ceilings that once held them together and nestled their memories, their photographs, their aspirations, their arguments, and all the things of living. A whole population 
displaced into tents, the best of them and the least of them reduced to foraging grass to cook as soup, waiting in long queues for a bottle of water and a bag of flour to make bread in makeshift ovens. There is no fuel, no clean water, no food, no electricity, no schools, no heating in the cold of this winter, no ambition except to live or perhaps join their beloved martyrs. No fully functioning hospitals left, no mosques, no minarets calling to prayer, no churches, no cultural centers left, no flowers or trees. Israel has bombed it all, all the infrastructure of life, leaving apocalyptic scenes that shock the conscience. Israel's unrelenting inhumanity beggars belief. And then you see the pathological celebrations taking place throughout Israeli society and your brain just short circuits. The humanity and outrage that propels us time and again by the millions to take to the streets all over the world have failed to stir world leaders to meaningful action, save for Yemen and South Africa. But it is not in vain because the masks have fallen. The lie of the only democracy in the Middle East is laid bare next to the multitude of debunked lies the Israeli political and military establishments have tried to pass off to the world. The epic myth of Israeli and Western benevolence has dissipated to expose their rotten imperial core that seeks to destroy and impose violent chaos in order to steal and extract what is not theirs, to line the pockets of the ruling elite there are whole Western populations who cannot be bothered to know or care about what is happening beyond their borders and even with its, when it's with their own public funds. Centuries of rapacious capitalism has turned them into empty shells of endless consumption and pollution, loneliness and depression, aimless people shopping their way through life, disconnected from each other and from our planet. But that too is changing, in large part thanks to Gaza. Palestinians in Gaza are teaching the world the meaning of community, of family, of faith, patience, perseverance, of resistance, and most importantly, of dignity. But they are not superhumans who should or can continue in to endure Israel's barbarity, the likes nor intensity of which we have not seen in modern history. And this genocide must stop. It is not an exaggeration to say that the outcome of this moment will determine human destiny for generations to come. Israel is the linchpin of Western imperialism. It is the last stand of the kind of genocidal settler colonialism that wiped out the indigenous nations of Turtle Island throughout Canada and the United States. Australia, and New Zealand. The outcome of this moment will determine whether we will live in a world where the wealthy and powerful have the final say on all matters and we are mere slaves to their world order. Or we will live in a world where peoples have a right to their own history and heritage and land and resources, where they are masters of their own fate where workers are the principal beneficiaries of the fruits of their own labor, and the people are organized to rise in unison where leaders fail the moral tests of our times. The bravery, determination, and commitment of the Palestinian resistance, together with the solidarity around the world, have foiled Israel's plans to colonize Gaza and expel her people into the Sinai as they originally expressed their plans. Israel's attempt to steal more Palestinian land and resources, especially Gaza's massive offshore gas fields worth trillions of dollars, has not gone well for them so far. And it is thanks to the resistance, to the steadfastness of Palestinians, and to all of you taking to the streets, sharing content from Gaza on social media, despite corporate silencing, and refusing to remain silent in the face of this genocide. 
This is a singular moment in our lifetime where conditions are ripe for revolution. Matt Kennard wrote on his Twitter account, quote, The empire has never been more exposed. The media has never been more exposed. The door is ajar. We have to kick it in, unquote. The struggle for the liberation of Palestine is a struggle for global liberation. It is not confined to the small patch of land called Gaza, or even to the whole of Palestine or the whole of the region of Western Asia and North Africa. Rather, it is a global issue that resonates with the very essence of universal justice. It embodies the fundamental right of a people to self-determination, to freedom and a life free of oppression. South Africa's decision to take Israel to the International Court of Justice on the charge of genocide is not just an attempt to halt this genocide and put Israel on trial. It is a challenge to this horrific world order we're forced to live in. It is the first stirrings of the global South rising in rebellion against centuries of Western tyranny and domination, against CIA orchestrated coups, their never ending wars, regime changes, genocides, exploitation, ruthless extraction and mindless pollution. Palestine has ignited a powerful phase of decolonization and those countries like South Africa and Yemen who are materially supporting us are leading us toward the world we're fighting for where dignity and rights are universal. The pursuit of justice for Palestine is the central fight against imperialism, colonialism, and the right of peoples to determine their own destiny in their own ancestral homelands. Thank you. Next, we're gonna hear a message from Dr. Chandra Masafar, who's president of the International Movement for a Just World in Malaysia. And it's going to be read by Sahir Al Kamash. The International Movement for a Just World commends the government of South Africa for requesting the International Court of Justice to issue an urgent order declaring that Israel is in breach of its obligations under the 1948 Genocide Convention for its massive slaughter of Palestinians living in Gaza. Israel, it is alleged, is attempting through its relentless bombardment of life and property to destroy in whole or in part the Palestinian community and identity. This is a clear violation of the Genocide Convention. The wanton barbaric massacre of Palestinians and the colossal destruction and devastation caused to Gaza by Israel have convinced a lot of people that what is happening in Gaza is blatant ethnic cleansing. Genocide targeting Palestinians, it must be emphasized, has been routinized in the last 75 years. It is because more and more people have come to know the Gazan story that there is increasing sympathy and support for the beleaguered Gazan population. If anything, the cruel and heartless massacre of children and babies in the last few months has come to epitomize the ongoing 75 year long catastrophe, or Nakba. The 153 nations that demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the West Bank in a United Nations General Assembly vote on December 12, 2023, reflect the global concern for the plight of the Palestinian people. South Africa has been at the forefront of this concern for many decades. The leaders of post-apartheid South Africa were among the most vocal in the global South to denounce inhuman Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu realized that Israeli discrimination and marginalization of the indigenous Palestinians was akin to apartheid. Mandela, 
who described the Palestinian struggle for self-determination as one of the greatest moral issues of our time, even observed that South Africans will not truly be free until the Palestinians are free. It is partly because of their own experience with apartheid that the people and leaders of South Africa display such rapport with the Palestinian cause. Other nations in the global south should also come forward. Indeed, since justice at the heart of the Palestinian struggle is so universal, let South Africa's example inspire people everywhere to act. Thank you. Thank you, Sahir. I would now like to bring to the podium Rabbi Joseph Cohen, an international sp spokesperson for the Notori Carta Anti-Zionist Orthodox Jewish Organization. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Peace be upon all of you. Today, we are all united in solidarity with the people of Gaza and Palestine that have unfortunately been the subject of the most brutal war and occupation in recent history. Zionism has been the source of suffering in Palestine for over 75 years, not only for Palestinians, but also for Jews who have stood up and refused to recognize the occupation of Palestine. Jewish rabbis from the very beginning of Zionism have been opposed to this philosophy and to the occupation of Palestine and have forewarned that Zionism will only lead to tragedy and bloodshed. Unfortunately, Zionism has many tactics to, to calm the world, to lead the world to believe uh, and what they have to sell. And one part of it is that they are misusing, Zionism has hijacked Judaism to justify their crimes. This criminal, Netanyahu, has the audacity to use the Torah. He does not believe in the Torah. He does not believe in God at all. He does not practice the religion. He's not practicing anything. But now, he takes quotes of the Torah, misrepresents them, misquoting the Torah to justify the crimes that the very Torah forbids. He takes quotes of the Torah out of its context to justify, and he's, to justify his war crimes, and he's falsifying Jewish history. The fact is that Torah teaches compassion, forbids killing and stealing. According to the Torah, Jews are in exile by divine decree and are supposed to be living as loyal citizens in the countries in which they, they reside and not to rebel or wage war against any other nation, not to be occupying another people's land, not to kill, not to steal. And now Zionism, the state of Israel, does everything in violation of Judaism. It still has the audacity to call itself, to use the Jewish symbols and to call themselves and to claim right to the land of Palestine in the name of the Jewish people. This is a desecration of this holy religion. For the sake of ending this violent, brutal occupation of 75 years, this terrible Nakba that started 75 years ago and continues till this day, for the sake of bringing peace in, the, in, in Palestine, we have to join this call to end the, the to immediately cease fire and to end the genocidal war in Gaza and to end the entire occupation in Palestine from the river to the sea. We, <laughs> we pray for the peaceful dismantlement of this entire entity called the State of Israel so then we can once again see peace in Palestine, hopefully soon. Amen. Thank you very much.
Baker, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Foreign Affairs Department. International Assembly Against Imperialism in Solidarity with the Palestinian Resistance. Workers' World Party, participants in the conference, leftist parties, workers' parties, dear comrades. I am speaking now under the Israeli bombing and under the Israeli genocide crimes against the Palestinian people. And at the same time, we are resisting for life in complete freedom and an end to the occupation. We live in difficult conditions. Our children drink their blood, eat their body parts, no water, no, no medicine, no food. I may be alive now, but I am not be alive tomorrow. When I die, my body will melt into the ground and mix with the dirt, and from it will grow the olive tree that symbolizes peace, freedom, and living in dignity. On the centenary of Lenin's death, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine renews and affirms that it still adheres to its socialist and Marxist-Leninist ideas and expresses this through practices and actions and not just words. The DFLP is struggling to end the Zionism the Zionist occupation on its lands and to establish a socialist and democratic state of Palestine, where the forces of the martyr Omar al Qasim and the military brigades of the DFLP confront the Israeli occupation army in the Gaza Strip and inflict defeats on it. What the Israeli occupying state is doing today in the Gaza Strip is genocide against the Palestinian people. It kills civilians, bombs hospitals, prevents the entry of humanitarian aid, and imposes a complete siege on the Palestinian people. More than 30,000 martyrs, 60,000 wounded, and 10,000 are missing, in addition to the complete destruction of infrastructure. The imperialist countries partner with the Israeli occupation state and support it to carry out its crimes against the Palestinian people. And this confirms Israel's connection to the global imperialism that we face today. We call you to put pressure on your governments to stop the war against the Palestinian people immediately. Bring humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip, releasing the prisoners and support the South Africa's a case against Israel in the International Court of Justice. Also, you can send your donations to, th to support the children of Gaza in light of the difficult tragic uh, circumstances and restrictions imposed by Israeli occupying state. Freedom for Palestine, freedom for the prisoners, mercy for the martyrs in the hope that we, we will meet on the land of independent, socialist and democratic Palestine and achieve all demands of the Palestinian people, ending the occupation, establishing a Palestinian state, the return of refugees and self-determination on, on our land. Thank you for all. Next, we will hear from Hassan Ataya from the Islamic Jihad Politburo, and he is the head of the um, Department of Arab and International Relations. Al-Sayyidat al-Fadilat, al-Sadat al-Kiram, تحية فلسطينية معطرة برائحة الموت ومسك الدم النازف في غزة والضفة الغربية لقد كشف العدوان الهمجي على غزة وحشية الحضارة الغربية وأسقط الأقنعة الزائفة عن وجوه دول الإجرام في العالم وأدعياء الحرية وحقوق الإنسان 
وعلى رأسهم أمريكا وبريطانيا وغيرهما من الدول المشاركة مع جيش العدو الصهيوني في قتل الأطفال والنساء والمدنيين في غزة وفي تدمير الكنائس والمساجد والمشافي والمراكز الطبية والمدارس ومراكز الإيواء والمباني السكنية على رؤوس أصحابها أو التي شكلت غطاء لهذه المجازر والجرائم وحرب الإبادة الجماعية وحرب التجوية سواء في وسائل الإعلام والمنظمات الدولية والأممية أم في تأمين الدعم المادي والمعنوي لكيان الاحتلال الذي يعتبر مرتكزا وقاعدة متقدمة في منطقتنا لمشروعهم الاستعماري الذي يهدف إلى نهب خيراتها وثرواتها ومقدراتها والتحكم باقتصادها وإعلامها وقرارها السياسي والأمني أيها الحضور الأعزاء لقد حرك هذا العدوان الوحشي النازي على الشعب الفلسطيني في غزة وفي الضفة الغربية كذلك وجدان الشعوب الحرة في العالم ودفعها للتظاهر والاحتجاج تضامنا مع شعبنا ومقاومته في فلسطين المحتلة ورفضا لما ترتكبه الصهيونية العالمية من مجازر وحشية وجرائم حرب يندى لها جبين الإنسانية كما دفع محبي الشعب الفلسطيني والمتعاطفين معه للبحث عن سبل تقديم الدعم المادي والمعنوي لأهلنا في غزة المحاصرين والمنكوبين والجرحى والمرضى والمسنين والرضع وغيرهم من الذين يعانون ما يعانون من قتل وتجويع وحصار ظالم لم يسبق له مثيل أيها الأحبة أنتم مدعوون إلى إسناد شعبنا ومقاومته بما تستطيعونه على مختلف المستويات وإن من أهم وسائل الدعم غير المباشر لفلسطين إطلاق حملات واسعة لمقاطعة البضائع الصهيونية ومنتجات الدول الشريكة في العدوان ونشر الوعي حول مخاطر شرائها والمساهمة في سفك الدم الفلسطيني بهذه الأموال التي تعود لصالح آلة القتل والإجرام الصهيونية وهنا لا بد من الإشارة إلى أن سلاح المقاطعة سلاح فتاك في المعركة الاقتصادية التي يشنها أعداؤنا ضد شعوبنا وبلداننا ولذلك أدعو كل من يستطيع استخدام هذا السلاح الفعال إلى عدم التقصير في ذلك وعدم, الاستخ... وعدم الاستخفاف بنتائجه المؤثرة وبما يؤديه من ضرر على اقتصاد الأعداء وفي نهاية كلمتي أشكركم على حسن الإصغاء والاستماع وأشكر منظمي هذا النشاط المهم وأتمنى لكم, لكم التوفيق والنجاح على أمل أن تتحرر فلسطين ومنطقتنا من الاحتلال الصهيوني والاستعمار الغربي ويعم السلام العالم كله إحسان عطايا رئيس دائرة العلاقات العربية والدولية عضو المكتب السياسي لحركة الجهاد الإسلامي في فلسطين Next we're going to hear from Michael Kramer, who's a former member of the Israeli Occupation Forces, 1973 Arab-Israeli War, who became a supporter of Palestinian resistance. President, he's now president of Veterans for Peace, New Jersey Chapter 021. Good afternoon, <clears throat> comrades and friends. Um, as an Israeli soldier, I took part in the occupation, not only of Palestine, but of Syria and Egypt. And I just want to expand a bit today 
our solidarity with the people of Syria who continue more than 60 years since 1967 um, in the Golan under a brutal occupation which in many ways mirrors the occupation of Palestine. Land expropriation, administrative detentions, unending imprisonment for decades. So uh, why don't we just give a round of applause to a people who, like the Palestinian people, are the definition of steadfastness, refuse to give up their land in the Golan. Thank you. The last few days, um, if you followed uh, the news from uh, Palestine uh, and Israel, you'll see there have been quite a few demonstrations uh, called by Israelis. And they're called by different organizations. And they have different agendas. Um, some are for the release of civilian detainees. Others are for, let's have elections and get rid of Netanyahu's government and bring in a new government. But yesterday, there was an interesting one. And this took place in Haifa. And there was a demonstration. The maximum allowed by police was 700 people. Uh, I don't know how many more would have gone. But very different from the others, we saw placards raised, stop the genocide, and it was a joint demonstration of Israelis and Palestinians under very, very difficult circumstances, uh, literally a police state with people armed all around them, both civilians and police, so, so we salute them. And we hope that is the beginning of a, of a movement uh, in Israel of uniting with Palestinian people. And it, it, it's in a context now of a growing instability. It looked stable right after October 7th. There was unity, but we see uh, Right now, there are fights even within the Israeli cabinet. Ministers walk out yelling at each other. And um, recently, the uh, leadership of the Israeli military uh, came out with a statement indicating that there is no victory over Hamas. And this is not really a battle against Hamas, because Hamas is just one organization. It's a battle against the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front, and the whole Palestinian people. Uh, the narrative tries to kind of put it in a place. This is a war against Hamas, Hamas, but it's not. It's a, it's a war against the Palestinian people, and it's a war and occupation that have been unending uh, since the beginning of the 20th century. Now, Zionism, uh, and I can speak from experience, uh, particularly for young people, is like a cult. Uh, very hard to break out of a cult, and some people never break out of a cult. And, um, but um, particularly for Israeli youth and, and youth here in the US, particularly Jewish youth here in the US, it is a cult. And it has deep roots in the populations. Um, but we're starting to see that those roots are beginning to rot uh, with all these demonstrations, particularly from uh, Jewish communities. And uh, they're rotting with a disease for which there is no anecdote or medicine. And that disease is anti-Zionism. And more and more people are raising anti-Zionism in this struggle. And that is, is a good thing. Now, the struggle uh, against the occupation of Palestine has many fronts. Um, as someone pointed out, there's the economic struggle that's been ongoing, boycott, divestment, sanctions, BDS. 
there's the military struggle. And then there's a struggle that uh, we recently got word of a number of Israeli youth have refused conscription. And um, we know of two so far. And I, I can tell you firsthand that these are truly heroic acts. So uh, we recognize Sophia Orr. She's 18 years old and Tal Mitnick. And not only have they, they quietly, um, they didn't just quietly refuse conscription, but they have gone public. And they have gone on the media, uh, French networks, Al Jazeera, Democracy Now! here, and have really made a strong political statements and trying to encourage other youth. So this is something uh, that we should definitely um, follow and monitor and support them because it is another front in the struggle against the occupation of Palestine. And um, lastly, I want to, um, one of our speakers, Larry, quote, uh, talked about Amical Cabral. Uh, the great African patriot who struggled uh, in the Cape Verde Islands and, and Guinea-Bissau. And um, a book written by actually someone who is in our audience, I'll put a plug in, Turn the Guns Around, uh, John Catalanato. Uh, it's a wonderful book for understanding mutinies and soldier revolts, which are not easy things when everybody's got guns loaded all around you. But uh, Amical Cabral on um, January 23rd, 1963, just a few days from short of being 60 years ago, issued this uh, long message to the soldiers, sergeants, and officers of the Portuguese colonial army. It's a very long statement. You can find it in the book, in the appendix. But I just want to read one paragraph. And he's talking to the Portuguese soldiers. Follow the example of your courageous comrades who refused to fight on our land, who revolted against the criminal orders of your leaders, who cooperate with our party or who abandoned the colonial army and found in our midst the best reception and fraternal aid. And uh, personally, I want to say that when I was first kind of figuring things out as a recently discharged Israeli soldier and hadn't yet crossed the total line with Palestinian uh, solidarity, I was embraced by the Palestinian community here in New York City. And uh, I'll always remember that. And that we look forward to solidarity between Israeli youth and the Palestinian people to overturn the occupation of Palestine and free Palestine from the river to the sea. Thank you. We're now going to hear from Dr. Amal Wadan, who's a former politi Palestinian political prisoner, organizer with One Democratic State of Palestine, and founder and editor of the Arab Gazette. On the 100th anniversary of the death of Comrade Lenin, we are facing the same odds he warned the enlightened leadership of the Bolsheviks and the national leaders of the Arab homeland from the conspiracies of the Euro European colonial empires of Britain and France who secretly signed the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, which resulted in the disintegration and colonization of the Arab homeland and divided it into separate countries and entities under the administration of appointed local leaders. 
The Palestine question during World War I was at the core interest of the U.S. Woodrow Wilson administration. In fact, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine was fully supported by this administration, and it was supported by the consecutive administrations all through the British mandate and the 1947 UN Resolution 181 known as the Partition Plan of Palestine and the establishment of the State of Israel, all of which were all adapted and supported by the USA. The Zionist paratroops, which were trained, granted advanced ammunition, mainstream media coverage, political and diplomatic support by the British, or carried out hundreds of massacres from the south to the north and along the Mediterranean coast to force indigenous Palestinian civilians outside the borders of their homeland, Palestine. The campaign of planned ethnic cleansing resulted in exiling 950,000 Palestinians and the destroying, burning, and displacing of 675 city neighborhoods, villages, and Bedouin communities. Since 1948, the Zionist colonial apartheid state has been granted $3.8 billion from the USA in addition to other forms of financial military assistance and high-tech investments. Today, with the ongoing Nakba of Gaza in its 107th days of continuous mass genocide, displacement, ethnic cleansing, thirst, starvation, maiming of Palestinians at the hands of the Zionist colonial apartheid military, are all under the sponsorship and unconditional support of the USA. This reminds us of the war crimes and crimes against humanity that took place in historic Palestine during the first Nakba, or what we call it, the ethnic cleansing war of 1948. Anthony Blinken visited occupied Palestine and met with Netanyahu and uh, the war cabinet five times since October 7th and on. The top of his agenda is the release of the Israeli prisoners in the captivity of the Palestinian resistance and disarmament of Hamas and forming a puppet political regime like the one in Ramallah. While the USA consecutive administrations never intervened to release any Palestinian political prisoner out of one million who were arrested by the Zionist establishment of occupation forces since its establishment, including those with chronic illness, administratively detained children and women. The American administrations never did a checklist to examine the Israeli commitment to Oslo agreement or pushed to establish the promised Palestinian state a provision signed on 30 years ago under the so-called two-state solution or illusion, as we say. It turned out to be that the USA was only deceiving the PLO through managing the crisis the American way, not solving it from its roots. The same imperial colonial ideology which manifests the culture of supremacy, greediness, racism, and death is still governing the world system of today the same world system which created the State of Israel at the expense of the Palestinian people and waged global wars and proxy wars has not changed. On the contrary, it will continue to seize any opportunity to deceive the Palestinians and the people of the world and will continue to advance and nourish the same culture of death, hegemony and wars for the interest of the few imperialists. The illusion that the Zionists want peace has been revealed through their terrorist measures over the past 75 years of occupation, including the 30 years of deception, but even more through their rampage and war on Gaza since October 7th. This occupation is the cruelest form known to mankind. Its apartheid policies are worse 
than those practiced in South Africa and like those of Nazi Germany. The USA had never opened its eyes to see the mounting pressure under the surface for the past 17 years of siege and blockade of Gaza or the deprivation of 2 million and 300,000 people of their basic human rights, such as the right of having clean water, food, medical care, proper shelters, freedom of movement and political activity. Now, after October 7th, the USA has remembered that the Palestinians must have their own state, but it should be according to their conditions. Now, now it admits that the death toll in Gaza has reached unprecedented count of 30,000, including those who are still under the rubble, in addition to more than 60,000 injured and 1.5 million displaced. Over 75% of the percentage of the casualties are children and women. Now, the USA had admitted that Zionist storyline about the Israeli settlers' babies being beheaded, burned, and women being raped was a big lie to mislead the international public opinion. Gaza today has reminded the people of the world of their own miseries under the current savage, monstrous, imperialist colonial world system and most importantly it showed them the power of being united. Gaza today has inspired the free people all over the world to rise up in millions for the common interest of humanity, social justice, equality and liberation. It is time to abolish and dismantle the colonial apartheid regime. It is time to establish a single democratic state of Palestine based on human rights and international law which preserves social justice, equality, cultural diversity, liberty and freedom for all. It is time to disconnect and disengage with all forms of political regimes based on oppression and subjugation of other nations. It is time to cut ties with imperialist and colonial regimes. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Just two more messages, and then we're going to have an announcement about lunch. Um, we're now going to hear from Charlotte Cates, who's the international coordinator of Samadun Pal Pal Palestinian Prisoners Solidarity Network. Greetings, comrades. My name is Charlotte Cates. I'm the International Coordinator of Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, and I'm honored to be here with you today at this International Assembly Against Imperialism in support of the Palestinian resistance, marking the 100th anniversary of the passing of the great revolutionary Vladimir Lenin. Of course, we are not alone in marking that anniversary, in remembering the life and struggle of Lenin, but also continuing to implement his theory and his practice toward revolutionary liberation from imperialism and capitalism here and everywhere around the world. And of course, the Palestinian prisoners and the Palestinian people have also witnessed there. Inside the Zionist jails, we often say that the Palestinian prisoners turn them into revolutionary schools. And just like, just like the, all, of, all of the great revolutionaries of the international Arab and Palestinian struggle are eagerly, are eagerly read, analyzed, and discussed among Palestinian prisoners in order to develop their own revolutionary analysis and continued struggle for the liberation of Palestine. Of course, we are having this meeting today at a particularly critical moment, indeed a revolutionary moment. Of course, this is also a moment of genocidal harm, when the true face of imperialism and Zionism cannot be denied by anybody around the world. The images of children being slaughtered, 
of schools and hospitals, mosques and churches, residential buildings and universities being razed to the ground by Zionist forces using the bombs, helicopters and airplanes provided to them by US imperialism and its imperialist partners in Canada, Britain, France and Germany show very clearly the nature of imperialism as a ruthless, rapacious system built on the destruction and dispossession of peoples and the confiscation of their wealth, resources, and lives in order for a few members of the ruling class to profit. Today, that is very clear in the genocide that is taking place in Gaza. And it is also very clear, however, that we are part not only of a moment of horror, but a moment of revolutionary upsurge. The heroic Palestinian operation on the 7th of October shook the foundations of Zionism and imperialism in the region. Today, the struggle is not only taking place in Gaza and not only in occupied Palestine. In Lebanon, where the Lebanese resistance led by Hezbollah is fighting, of course, in revolutionary Yemen, where the Yemeni people, their government, their armed forces, and the Ansar Allah movement are shutting down and blockading the blockaders, the sanctioners, and the exploiters by refusing to allow traffic to go through to the Zionist ports during this genocide, insisting on breaking the siege, or refusing to bow down to the threats, bombs, and terrorist designations of the imperialists to Iraq, where the resistance forces continue to fight to liberate all of their land from U.S. occupation, to Syria and beyond. The entire region is rising up and presenting a future that can be free of Zionism and imperialism. We have seen the truly destructive nature of the wounded beast of imperialism since October 7th. And October 7th was a momentous and heroic action for many reasons, and it was undertaken for many reasons by the Palestinian resistance to break the siege, to end once and for all the attempt to liquidate the Palestinian cause, to put an end to normalization between reactionary Arab regimes and the Zionist project but also and quite fundamentally and centrally to liberate the thousands upon thousands of Palestinian prisoners locked inside Zionist jails, subject to torture, subjected to ongoing medical neglect and abuse, denied access to their families, isolated children, men, women, elders, people of all generations, fundamentally of the Palestinian popular classes. The Palestinian prisoners are not only victims of the occupation, they are also resistance leaders and the resistance is fighting for their liberation. I invite all of you to join with us in organizing for the liberation of Palestinian prisoners as part and parcel of the liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea, the liberation of the Arab nation and the region from imperialism, and the liberation of humanity. The Palestinian resistance have opened the door to a new revolutionary movement at a new revolutionary moment, and it is up to all of us to build the movement necessary to stand with them to achieve victory and liberation. Okay, we've come to the end of our panel, but this panel on Palestinian resistance would not be complete if we don't hear from Hamas. And uh, I wanted to read just a short statement uh, that was put out by Hamas on January 17th in defending Yemen. In the Islamic resistance movement Hamas, we condemn in the strongest terms Washington's relisting of Ansar Allah in Yemen as a quote unquote global terrorist organization. We consider it a politicized decision a blatant bias towards the occupation and a clear attempt to protect it and provide cover for it to complete its brutal aggression and the genocide it commits against our Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. This unethical and politicized designation once again proves the alignment of President Biden's administration with the Zionist occupation and expansionist agenda in Palestine and the region. 
we affirm that the American policies will not deter the movement of the Arab and free peoples of the world from standing in solidarity with our Palestinian people and their just cause until the occupation is eliminated and our people's aspirations for freedom and self-determination are achieved. We also express our high appreciation and values for the efforts of Yemen and all of the resistance forces in their support for Palestine and Al-Quds, affirming their commitment to our unity as one nation in confronting the occupation and savage Zionism, Zionism Islamic resistance movement Hamas.